Well, we're getting a little bit closer to time, so I'm going to start introducing uh, Dr. Elizabeth McDonald, or she goes by Liz. Um, so, uh, Liz, Dr. Elizabeth McDonald. So, Liz McDonald's research has focused on experimental particle measurement techniques and data analysis in the magnetosphere and the ionosphere for the last 15 years. She is currently a co investigator on the helium, oxygen, proton, and electron spectrometer on the NASA Van Allen Probe's mission. At the, um, at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, or LANL, Liz was the principal investigator for the Z plasma spectrometer on the DOE Space and Atmospheric Burst Reporting Sabers geosynchronous payload. Liz also led the innovative research and integrated sensing IRIS team. In the past, Liz led the DOE-funded technology infusion project entitled, entitled Modular Advanced Space Environment Instrumentation from 2009 through 2011, and she served as a principal investigator for the Advanced Miniaturized Plasma Spectrometer on the DOE Savers Validation Experiment Payload 2007 to 2008. Liz has a blend of expertise in both instrument development and data analysis and interpretation, and that comes from sounding rocket and satellite instrumentation experience. This experience ranges over the complete cycle of instrument production, including design and modeling, integration testing, calibration satellite operations, and in-situ scientific data analysis. General interests include instrument technology development, basic magnetospheric science, and space situational awareness national priorities analysis. Uh, scientific specific research interests include wave particle interactions and the effect of plasma on radiation belt dynamics, mapping, coupling, and transport between the ionosphere and inner magnetosphere, and the impact of heavy ions on geomagnetic storm processes. Liz holds master's and PhD degrees from the University of New Hampshire and a bachelor in physics from the University of Washington, which was largely funded by a NASA Space Grant scholarship. Liz is a founder and leader of Aurora Source a citizen science project for studying the aurora. So welcome, Liz. Uh, why don't I hand it over to you, and you still have about two minutes before your talk begins, but uh, you can go ahead and introduce yourself and take the floor. Sure. Great, thank you so much, Nathaniel, for the invitation to be here. I'm excited to talk to you all. It's really a special group, a special audience to talk to. Let me see if I can share my screen and, uh, that could take two minutes right there. Um, Cause I have two screens in my home office here. Are you guys getting something? Yes, oh. we can see that just fine. Looks great, Liz. Okay, great. I have a bunch of slides, so I'm gonna launch into them. Um, today I'm here, as you said, uh, the founder of the Aurora Citizen Science Project called Aurora Soros. Uh, I work at NASA Goddard now, and I am also the Heliophysics uh, Citizen Science Lead at NASA Headquarters, which is a new role. Um, I'm mostly not speaking for that role today, unless otherwise noted, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, and uh, so I can talk about how citizen science is um, rising and important to NASA as well. Um, and I do want to acknowledge uh, support from the NASA Space Science Education Consortium, National Science Foundation, and the New Mexico Consortium, which is where I was when I began uh, this project and um, still hosts the Citizen Science Project uh, Aurora Source on their, on their servers. Okay, uh, is that sounding good? That sounds good. great, Liz. Yeah, right. looks good. Great. So a little bit of a background here, um, maybe some pretty pictures to go along with all the words. Nathaniel just uh, spoke about some of the hardware work that I've done in the past. Um, on the upper right here, you see uh, a particle instrument that uh, flew at flies at geosynchronous orbit, um, way out seven Earth radii out in the magnetosphere as part of a DOE mission. And then in the lower left here, uh, a similar instrument for satellites that uh, flew on the NASA Van Allen probes, which were two satellites that studied the radiation belts. 
Um, both of these instruments measure the very coldest plasma charged particles in the magnetosphere. Um, this is what I started doing after my PhD. And prior to that, uh, kind of the picture in the center uh, middle here um, was me with the sounding rocket. And that was work that I did also on particle instruments um, during my PhD. And through all of this, um, I would say that I am a very amateur Aurora chaser and definitely an amateur Aurora photographer. There's a lot of people who are um, a lot more uh, specialized in that and have a lot more skill in rural photography. Um, okay, so now you know a little bit about me. I'd like to learn a little bit about you. This is gonna be challenging. I'm gonna try to read your minds here, but I'm wondering how many of you have seen Aurora? And actually I'm guessing that um, probably more of the hams have seen Aurora than the scientists in this audience. Um, in other audiences, I've spoken to many of the space scientists because we study such a vast system, look at our data, uh, but don't actually necessarily see the aurora, even if the data that you study or the models might directly relate to aurora. So uh, that's, that's interesting. And then how many of you are familiar with uh, citizen science? This is super awesome that most of you contributing to HAMSI, I would guess, are. Um, and then how many have done citizen science with auroras? I'm guessing not as many. And so this is where most of this talk is aimed at um, increasing the number of folks who want to contribute there. Okay, so way back in 2011, I had a new idea about how ordinary people could help study Aurora. And that actually started during a storm of enhanced Aurora. It was visible all the way down as far south as Alabama. And I only learned that because I got on a website called Twitter that I had not otherwise um, ever tried and saw that people were tweeting about seeing this particular aurora, which was very red, which means it's extremely high in the atmosphere and can be seen um, much further south. And so I just thought we need to get these observations on a map. And the idea began to do that. Um, citizen science came in later, which is where we are including um, uh, we built a website so that people can report their observations and they don't have to use Twitter, although we also um, encourage and collect observations from Twitter as well. Because I am also curious how many of you use Twitter and I'm guessing probably it's not, not everybody for sure. Um, but Twitter has a really great API that makes it a useful source of data for this information. And so the idea is that uh, uh, Aurora is not just a pretty picture. And the picture in this slide is actually from a Nike ad. There are many, many companies using Aurora in their ads, but it's actually something that, you know, people see it and they go, oh, wow, that's really pretty. But they don't know that this is a whole field. There's a lot of complex and beautiful plasma physics here and that people could participate and it affects our daily lives. Um, so through citizen science is a way that, uh, that people can participate, um, asking questions, contributing observations, volunteering, and this works on a large scale. It works uh, during our storms and um, has been working for the last uh, solar maximum and on to the next solar maximum. Um, okay, so a few things about citizen science. This is, this is kind of aimed um, at some of the scientists in the audience, but also the ham radio folks. Uh, there's a multitude of project sizes, right? So Aurorasaurus and HamSci are kind of in the medium range. We're not huge projects. Um, our project has about 7,000 registered participants. And um, ham radio, ham size is probably bigger than that. But there are projects that get millions, millions of observations per year. And that is really awesome. Um, iNaturalist is one of them. You can check that out. It's really great. And um, 
There are also projects that only need a couple of participants to create useful data and uh, help contribute. So it all depends on what scale um, and uh, a lot of the resources scale with the size of the project. Um, so there are dedicated communities. Uh, there's a whole field of practitioners in citizen science. There's a um, mention of the Citizen Science Association on the bottom of this slide. That's a really great group of people who are figuring out across many different fields the commonalities between citizen science projects and how to do this better. Uh, and then, you know, um, building a project in a discipline requires a dedicated community. In your case, I definitely want to recognize the ham radio community for um, being so willing to do the science and so naturally amenable to this additional um, method. And it's really great all of the expertise that you have and that you bring to this effort. Uh, in the case of the auroral uh, enthusiast community, um, also really great uh, existing communities of people who love the aurora, who go out and chase the aurora, um, not as well organized because there are a lot of different gaps. And even when we started this project, we weren't entirely sure who our audience was. Um, it turns out there's a lot of photographers and there's a lot of people in many different fields um, who are interested in aurora and like regionally connected. Uh, and so we try and reach out to the regional groups. Um, okay, another important thing is really terms of use for the data and volunteers and making good use of volunteer time. Um, and uh, having science goals, and it's not free to do all of this, um, but uh, um, designing the project so that you can answer those science goals and so that the data are useful and we understand what the appropriate questions are is important. Um, okay, so my NASA headquarters hat for just a minute here. Um, citizen science at NASA. There is a new policy um, that came out in late 2018 called SPD 33. There's a link right there. Any of you who are interested in citizen science at NASA, definitely check it out. Um, there's a lot of great information about defining citizen science, how we're going to evaluate it, and um, where it can fit within uh, the Science Mission Directorate, sorry, that's SMD, um, at NASA. So science is separate from human space flight, all those kinds of divisions. Um, under science, there's different science areas. And the area that uh, myself, Nathaniel, Phil, all of us are in is called heliophysics. Um, heliophysics has its own strategic working group on implementing this policy that uh, just came out um, because we haven't done as much citizen science as some other fields, especially earth science. However, we have some really excellent use cases for citizen science and some early projects that have demonstrated this, um, such as, uh, you know, Aurora Source and Hamza. So uh, we are working on a plan, a strategic five year plan. Um, I'm actually the lead of this group. And the plan is to accommodate different sizes of projects, different opportunities. Looking over the next five years, certainly the next major North American eclipse and solar max are really key opportunities for citizen science and heliophysics. There's more to come. If you wanna get involved in the NASA community, there will hopefully be a second citizen science meeting of NASA folks across all science disciplines in July and Maine. And then there's this eclipse uh, funding opportunity for 2020 that I just um, put a link to uh, yesterday in the chat and wanted to mention that citizen science is extremely suitable and mentioned in that call. Uh, and then we're really looking at how the community is receiving citizen science, how we can better navigate that. And there may be some interdisciplinary reviewing opportunities as well. All right, now I'm moving on to the science and um, starting with this kind of cartoon view that many of you have probably seen of the sun giving us a huge emission of particles, uh, those coming in impacting the Earth's magnetic field, causing the magnetic field to stretch on the night side in the magneto tail like a rubber band. 
um, until you get a release and that release causes particles that are tied to those magnetic field lines in the magnetosphere, the Earth's magnetic field, to come back towards Earth and cause aurora. I'm going to get more into this, so I'm going to keep going. Um, but really, this cartoon is, shows a very, very simple picture. And it's extremely difficult to figure out all the parts of that picture. Um, one of the reasons is because the distance from the sun to the earth is 93 million miles. And that's a huge, vast different distance. We have several satellites that study the sun. Um, however, it's such a long way away that what we can see is we can see those particles, especially the large emissions of particles that come towards us, but we can't see, um, the sun is always giving us not just light, but charged particles in the solar wind. And it's always constantly varying. And so what really matters for the sun's magnetic field interacting with the Earth's protective magnetic field in its magnetosphere is the, um, the sense of the magnet of the Earth's interplanetary, sorry, the sun's interplanetary magnetic field. The Earth has a magnetic field like a dipole magnet. It's always in a fixed direction. Um, but the sun's magnetic field way out here at Earth is constantly varying. And so you get a different amount of um, attraction between those two magnetic fields or repulsion. And that controls how the energy from the sun is coupled into the Earth's magnetosphere, which then controls uh, the strength of aurora and many other space weather effects. And so it's important that we don't know that magnetic field strength um, until we sample the plasma at one special spot called L1, Lagrangian point one, where the sun's gravity and the Earth's gravity balance. So you can have some satellites hang out here. And those satellites uh, monitor the solar wind and they sense the mag they uh, measure the magnetic field in the solar wind, which is what's really important for understanding how big um, the aurora, the auroral oval will get. And so that's 1 million miles. That spot L1 is 1 million miles upstream of Earth. And so it's great that we have that monitor, that buoy out there in the solar wind. Um, but that only gives us about a one hour warning of that strength of um, coupling. And so what you often see is we see things happening on the sun and we have a heads up of how big um, those effects might be, but they're, what's not often understood or communicated particularly well is how um, large the uncertainties are on those forecasts. And so we really can't tell you because 93 million miles is such a vast distance exactly when that's going to hit and because we can't um, just looking at the sun we can't predict the magnetic field magnitude or direction when it hits we can't tell you how strong it's really going to be so those are really two important factors i'll talk a little bit more about them but i'm going to keep moving on because i have lots of slides here uh, this one shows the earth's dipole magnetic field and kind of zooms in again this is very conceptual uh, as far as um, showing particles trapped on the magnetic field lines. They have all kinds of characteristic um, motions and energies, and they are precipitating, like raining down on the atmosphere and at a certain, certain latitude. And when they do, they excite the, the molecules of the upper atmosphere, cause them to emit light. That is what we see as the beautiful aurora. Uh, the color depends on what altitude is being hit and what species is being hit. And so actually oxygen causes both the primary uh, green and uh, red colors, but at different altitudes. And that has to do with the density varying as you go down lower in altitude. All of the aurora happens extremely high up. It happens 100 kilometers, 60 miles. 10 times higher than all of our earth weather. Um, and so uh, that's also um, very important. This is the edge of space. It's a mix of, um, there's a mix of neutral and charged particles, but it's not very dense at all. Um, I will also note that um, 
many of you are probably much more expert at the D region and E region and the plasma than I am. Um, this is not the part that I have studied all that much, but we will, that's why we are going to work together on all of this. Um, okay. All right. Moving on rapidly here. Uh, heliophysics is important because there, all of this, all this space weather has um, the potential to impact our society. Um, the aurora are large currents. They um, rain down on earth. They can induce other problems in um, current systems on earth. And that can have costly effects like power uh, blackouts um, and interruptions to GPS and other systems. So um, that's one driver. That's the space weather driver um, and importance. Uh, aurora are also universal um, particle acceleration mechanisms. And uh, it's important to visualize them and fully characterize uh, this system to the extent that we can from Earth. This relates to um, other planets as well. But here, we can actually do this. We can sense and um, measure all of the plasma physics happening. However, we do not have global imaging of the aurora 24 seven. Um, we have had it in the past, but we do not have it right now. Um, we also still have very coarse miles, sorry, very coarse models of the aurora. And they don't predict the actual um, forms and shapes of aurora that you see. And so there's a lot of room for improvement there. And all of this is to say that um, our satellites are covering the space, but not fully covering the space. Satellites are very expensive. This is all part of why there's a really good use case for citizen science, both for auroras and ham radio in this space. Um, Talking a little bit more about space weather here, I uh, got some questions from the Google um, about what time is Aurora going to happen tonight and how high does KP have to be to see Aurora. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions. These are all very good questions that have answers that are unsatisfying and that we don't fully, there's a, there's a lot of gaps in how we communicate space weather. Um, Space weather also is very complex. There's a lot of different time scales and different types of threats. Um, I'm primarily talking about aurora here today. Um, uh, people who um, follow space weather um, may want to follow the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center, SWPC, as it's called, SWPC. They are the official sources of real-time space weather data for the United States. Um, that data is operational, it's coming from satellites and available 24-7. <clears throat> However, the public are not paying customers of that space weather data. Most of the plots and interpretation is aimed at um, military, commercial satellites, the FAA, a lot of different customers of space weather. Um, as we saw yesterday, it's also difficult because um, there's a lot of different communication gaps. And those are difficult because space plasma physics is not too well known. And in fact, it's not something you can really major in as an undergrad. And so um, you can take, you can do research as an undergrad, but most people come into the field in graduate school where you have a lot of advanced electricity and magnetism and um, a lot of, um, uh, terms and terminology, and it's all at a pretty high level. Um, and there's a gap to what's kind of the undergrad level, what's the conceptual level, um, how we communicate all of this. So in our case, um, we've chosen to focus on Aurora. Um, with citizen science, we want to form the bridge between the very interested public um, and that public ranges and in there, um, some people are already expert on space weather data and some people just wanna see Aurora. Um, and uh, form the bridge between that community and the professional science community and really um, try and listen to both sides and do science together. Okay, now Aurorasaurus, what are we doing? So 
<clears throat> so um, this is the one busy slide all about Aurorasaurus showing you that we have um, a website. It's primarily got a map on it with a um, prediction of the model of where the aurora should be and other data sources on um, where people are reporting aurora. Uh, there's several photos that are um, people can um, can contribute. There's uh, several papers that we've that we have done with uh, these types of data. Um, there's the website platform and there are also apps. Beware the apps are not currently in the app store. Apologize for that. Um, we're renovating our website and our apps. Um, it's been a little while and um, since 2014 when those came out, there's a lot of maintenance that's needed with apps. Um, and this kind of um, really modern software stack as well. So uh, that's something that we're we are actively working on and, and you will hear um, when things are are fully working again. Okay. Uh, to go um, to go into more detail on uh, what you see when you go to the website, um, what you see is a map. And on the map, there's this uh, colored green and red region showing the probability of Aurora, where Aurora should be. Uh, sorry, I'm using my cursor crazily. Um, so that's uh, this region here. And then there's also a red line, which is the prediction of where you should be able to see Aurora um, because it's so high up in the sky, you can see it um, quite a ways south of where the Aurora is overhead. And then there's different types of inputs. So the inputs um, include uh, someone who's gone to the website and said, yes, I see Aurora. Someone who said, no, unfortunately, I don't see Aurora. Those are the red pins. And then different types of tweets. Um, you can read much more about this in the paper. Um, and the kernel of information that we really need, the basic, the most basic useful piece of information is when and where you are seeing Aurora. Um, and so that in and of itself is useful to help us build better models of Aurora. Um, the website also has a form with additional questions that we ask you to fill out, including what um, colors there are, what different types of arcs of um, forms of aurora you might see, where in the sky it was, um, how active it was moving. And so it's very important. Um, I want to communicate that we've chosen to make this form um, simple but scientifically useful. And so all of those parameters uh, tell us something important about the type of aurora and are useful. And it's a balancing game between those things. Um, because Aurora Source was built for uh, just aurora, these are not exactly the same questions you'd have for uh, radio aurora as well. Um, you can also upload a photo. And there's notes fields. You can give more information as well. Um, OK. So what about the KP index? What about DST index? All that stuff. How can I see Aurora? Um, I just want to point out that uh, it's, it's a challenge. Um, the KP index is a global index, a global scale. Um, it was developed at a time where real-time data was not possible. It was a three-hour index. Um, now we have estimates of the KP index that are driven by monitoring the solar wind at the L1 point. And so that's, um, that's better. Uh, but still, uh, Aurora enthusiasts and people who regularly go out and spot Aurora will tell you, and I will tell you, that KP index is not going to correlate to the peak of the Aurora where you are locally. Um, so it's, again, a general useful parameter. Um, to, to get more into what, um, what's useful for you locally, uh, you can look at the solar wind data. In that case, you need to be concerned about both the velocity of the solar wind and the magnetic field magnitude and direction. Um, 
on our uh, website, we have chosen to put those parameters together in a um, simple, one simple plot that goes up when activity goes up and tells you how much power is in the solar wind. Um, and so this is um, something that is useful for some people for seeing Aurora. Um, it also has a you know, color scale so that it can tell you how large the storm is going to be. Um, but again, it doesn't tell you exactly when and where you can see Aurora. The idea is that you would be using, um, you can use the map for your own purposes, you know, depending on where you are and how much you really want to see it. Um, we have different levels of alerts. Um, so you can sign up for an account and um, the alerts will tell you, um, one, if you are in a region where this view line, the model prediction tells you you can see Aurora. Um, and two, the second alert, which is much stronger, will tell you if you are in a region that there's a cluster of people around you who are reporting Aurora. Um, and yeah, you might really want to go out and see if the sky is clear where you are. So those are the alerts that, that we give. Um, and we ask people to help us verify that view line that's been demonstrated very successfully on the southern edge of the auroral oval, especially over the last solar maximum. Um, uh, we also have a way that people can help us find the really relevant tweets out of the whole stream of Twitter. Um, we are able to search that. We have keywords. We can pull out tweets about Aurora that have locations. Um, however, uh, it's the machine, the computer, can't tell us, did someone just say, I just want to see Aurora or I just did see Aurora? And so we serve these tweets on our website with um, the information and ask people to help us upvote or downvote um, and find, pick out the needles in the haystack. And it actually works and it's actually useful. So we also have papers on that. Um, but I only have 15 minutes left, so I'm gonna keep going quickly. Um, but what we see is that people are, people are out there, people are really, um, keen observers. And in fact, um, now, especially since cameras are get, have gotten so much better and better, um, people can effectively beat the view line. And so we've adjusted our view line on our website uh, to better account for where people are actually seeing the aurora. Um, and uh, want to move on to um, some ideas for what a ham radio or a ham aurorasaurus could look like. So I want to acknowledge that there are already some maps of radio aurora. I don't know too much about this. Um, Andy Smith, Dave Edwards are a couple of folks um, who have um, put up these maps and, and talk about them. Uh, but you can definitely see the region of the radio aurora along with the region where people are reporting different types of um, aurora would be useful to correlate. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I am, um, there are additional radio aurora specific terms and questions that you'd probably want to ask. I have not talked about absorption or solar energetic particle events or how the sun can directly cause some radio signals um, because that's, um, that's just not there yet, but you'd want to um, if we were to put these kinds of things together. Um, there are really interesting science questions that can be asked. How the radio aurora maps to structures and um, that coordinates uh, different types of observers. So you could be there in um, somewhere you can't see Aurora, but somebody right at the midpoint of your um, signal is actually seeing a specific structure overhead. That would be super cool to put that data together um, and build a platform that can help um, collect that data at scale. Um, can the radio aurora map peaks in um, or substorm onsets, um, peaks in activity, otherwise known as substorm onsets, or unique features that happen at the lower latitude edge of the aurora, something new I'm about to talk about called Steve. Um, 
Okay, so uh, very interested in your suggestions for what that could be. Um, I'm going to keep going here, I think. Okay, um, I have a few more slides on Aurora and um, some myths about Aurora. So um, the first myth is that it's directly caused by particles from the sun. Almost all aurora is not directly caused by solar wind particles. Those particles enter the Earth's magnetosphere and um, become trapped in the Earth's magnetic field, mix with the particles in the Earth's magnetic field, um, such as from our atmosphere, and all kinds of things happen. So that's, um, that's a myth relating to you know, the fact that we don't explain what's happening in the magnetosphere all that much. Oh, look at that. The sun. Sun is interrupting my talk. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, this is also a, a like graduate level cartoon about the magnetosphere. We need to develop more um, conceptual and visualizations of, of how this process happens. Um, and then we need to also account for the fact that the aurora is multi-scale, beautiful, um, really complex as well. And so when you're actually going out and seeing it, um, there's all kinds of different features that, that happen. Um, if you've seen one storm, you've really only seen one storm. So it's, it's a great um, challenge to keep observing it. Um, okay, and another myth is that the aurora only happens during storms. It happens all the time. Um, there's everyday aurora far to the north and the south, um, and there's always, I've referred to, substorms, which are kind of the regular cycle of energy storage and release um, from the solar wind into the Earth's magnetic field, and that has characteristic um, types of aurora associated with it. And then from a local perspective, you see certain things. Um, these photos are some that I took recently on my cell phone way up in Yellowknife, Canada. Um, and you see the aurora start in the northeast. You see it come overhead. Um, and sometimes you see it break up overhead, or maybe it breaks up a long way to the east or the west. And you can't really see that as much. but you are part of a global cycle. And so often from the science perspective, we are looking at the um, global uh, view of this and not communicating as well the local perspectives. Um, okay, so this is one quick slide on what is a substorm um, from the global perspective, which was a really big deal when it was figured out in the late 50s. Um, so, but I have to explain what these, um, these uh, cartoons, diagrams show. And the important thing in any kind of many of these plots is where is the sun. The sun is at the top. Um, this is the day side. Uh, midnight is at the bottom. Um, dusk is at the left and dawn is at the right. And so these cartoons show kind of the types of aurora that happen in this regular substorm cycle. And the key thing is that if you are to know where you are, because this, the auroral oval is rotating above you, um, or you are rotating below the auroral oval, excuse me, that's a better way to put it. Um, but um, as, as the night progresses, you're going to see different types of aurora, and that also couples into this cycle and when it happens and when you get that explosive release. So um, things that happens often near midnight, but it can vary depending on what the solar wind's doing as well. All right, I'm gonna keep going. People, when the aurora peaks and you have these substorm onsets, there's a million dollar question, more than a million dollar question really, what causes that? Does that trigger way out in space? Could it be triggered in the ionosphere? There are different camps, and this has been studied for a long time, but there are still open questions there. And people notice different specific um, short-lived phenomena around the time of those peaks. 
Um, in this example, this is a photo someone took of a very coherent structure of beads, um, which could be an important wave particle phenomena that sets up over a long region right at the time of this peak. Um, it's also important to point out that uh, the scale size that you can see with um, a normal camera is different than the scientific grade cameras that we have. So people are seeing different things and um, complementing each other. Now I'm going to shift to Steve, which is a different thing entirely. Um, on the southern edge of the auroral oval, when um, you can only just barely see the aurora to the north, people, especially in the Alberta, Canada region, were seeing something overhead. And um, that is Steve. Uh, let's see if I can play this. Take a brief break here. People were observing the aurora and they started noticing something that was overhead as well when they were seeing the aurora far to the northern regions. It was unlike most aurora. Talk to the scientists, we didn't know what it was. And together, they said, we'll keep taking observations and we'll call it Steve in the meantime. Steve is mostly a very narrow purple arc and sometimes it has these little green features that go along with it as well that are kind of like waving fingers or a picket fence. That means that there's plasma physics happening up there to cause that light and to make these little discrete features that we don't understand yet. We now have some satellite observations from the ESA satellite called Swarm that show uh, that Steve optically is associated with a very strong flow um, in the particles in the ionosphere, the upper level of our atmosphere. Steve is important for a number of reasons. Um, it's really exciting that uh, people armed with cameras all over the globe can capture something that we didn't fully understand and shed new light on that. It's also really exciting that this happens further to the south where there are, more, there are more people. So it might be a kind of aurora that more people can see than the usual kind. We're now able to look up at the sky and see things about the aurora and this sub-auroral region that we never understood before. And then we can correlate that with our traditional observations and lead to greater understanding. All right, great. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Steve and the paper and what we really found. Um, so um, people were seeing this and, um, and we started to have a concerted effort scientists, the citizen science community, the Aurorasaurus project, the Alberta Aurora Chasers, um, to further uh, get more information. And there was an event where there was an instrumented scientific satellite, the European Space Agency satellite Swarm, um, went right through a Steve. And, and there was data on the ground and there, from citizen scientists, multiple citizen scientists, and the Canadian uh, ground stations as well. And then we saw um, what this looked like in the particle data when you are at uh, 400, 500 kilometers. And what it looked like is actually a um, very strong flow. So this is a very atypical aurora, um, which is normally particle precipitation. This is a, a east to west flow of charged particles and um, very heated electrons in the underlying uh, atmosphere as well. And so Steve became um, a backronym, uh, strong thermal emission velocity enhancement. There's a lot more research on Steve. You'll hear more about this in the afternoon. Um, and, but I want to point out that uh, this bump, this strong velocity that is seen when the satellite cuts through the phenomena that's east-west, your satellite's cutting through north-south. So it's really zipping by and giving you like a few, a brief observation. And so it looks like a peak of um, velocity of the charged particles in that way. Uh, that's been seen for 40 years, but was never actually known to be visible 
And so the fact that citizen scientists on the ground can now show how this thing changes over an hour or so is really cool, um, especially because it also has these unstable green um, picket fence structures as well. And, uh, and that's just a, a um, amazing phenomena that we're still trying to figure out how all of the plasma physics that's being caused there. All right. Um, however, a new uh, paper um, by um, Michael Hunnicol, an amazing citizen scientist, you'll hear more about this afternoon, and myself, um, showed that um, Steve is not totally new, and we've known Steve is not new. People have photographed it even before we started researching it, but we didn't know that people had actually studied it 100 years ago and even prior to that. Um, and so very uh, famous, amazing um, Norwegian scientist, Carl Stormer, took observations of the aurora with um, simultaneous observers connected by telephone 100 years ago, 12,000 photographs of aurora, all of the height of aurora. He saw Steve on seven days. Uh, and there are papers about that um, that we never found because he called them feeble homogeneous arcs of great altitude. And so they do have a higher altitude um, than the typical 100 kilometers. They're about 200 kilometers where that light is occurring. There's a lot more going on. There's more I can say. Um, I'll try and answer questions and we'll get to more of that this afternoon. But, um, all right. You can follow Steve on Twitter. There's more sightings. I'm wrapping up. Um, Steve has gone, Steve and Aurorasaurus um, have had quite a bit of media attention and that really helps recruit and reward the citizen scientists for all of their efforts as well. Um, I'm gonna throw a few links at you here at the end. Um, and uh, we have a blog, blog.aurorasaurus.org and different posts about all kinds of things about aurora and space weather, so you're welcome to that. Um, these, this whole talk is available, so um, recommend if you have kids that might want to learn more about Steve, there's a really great podcast. There's some well, webinars on our YouTube channel. There's, there's stuff there. Um, there's also opportunities for adults um, to learn more and to even see a documentary film about Steve. Uh, you can already see it on demand in Canada, and it'll be on demand in the U.S. in April. And then finally, almost finally, um, there's a page here with a bunch of free resources for further study that are really high quality resources at kind of the conceptual undergrad level um, that I highly recommend. All right. Uh, for the researchers, we're very interested in folks joining us, um, different types of observations. Um, there's more we can correlate with what we've already done and looking for a postdoc. And um, really excited for the next SolarMax, um, adapting the, the technology. People are gonna have so many more photos on their cell phones. It's gonna be really awesome. And there is in the field, uh, renewed interest in satellite auroral imaging. So that's coming um, and the future is bright. Thank you very much. Yay, thank you very much, Liz. I agree. <laughs> That's wonderful. When am I gonna get my ham license? I just saw that. You yeah. just saw that. I was going to point that out to you. <laughs> That's a great question. It's a great question. We'll, we'll work on that. Well, yeah. we're, we're supposed to get it this weekend, right, Liz? But <laughs> when you came to Scranton, but unfortunately had to delay the, the testing session. So we'll get you the next time. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it'll be soon. You'll get your hand license soon. All right. But I think, um, I think this is a fantastic talk. And um, I think for the ham site community, I think some of the slides that you put in about showing how, you know, hams are already looking into the auroral zone, which many of the people on here, I'm sure know, already and i i think the way you show that you know we can really learn uh new science or bring out things that have you know maybe been forgotten about from the long past just by uh talking with people who do uh who make observations or uh take photos or um uh, you know do this sort of thing as a as a hobby you know it's we can get real science out of this and i think that is just a fantastic thing